Hello and welcome to The Morning Show with Sybil Mulcahy and myself, Brian Daly. Coming up today, they were sexually abused by their father from a young age. Three Dublin sisters will be telling us about the impact abuse has had on their lives. Well, my father used to click his fingers, say, when you'd hear that sound, you'd freeze and you'd hope that it wasn't you he was calling. But first today, Joyce, June and Paula Kavna grew up in Ballyfermot in Dublin in the 1960s and were each abused by their father from a very young age. They made the decision in 1989 to prosecute their father at a time when sexual abuse cases were still covered up and swept under the carpet. The sisters have since talked openly about what happened and say they have come to terms with their abuse but are determined not to allow the abuse to find them. Well, my father used to click his fingers, say, when you'd hear that sound, you'd freeze and you'd hope that it wasn't you he was calling. He could be, he'd often come in and click his fingers to get a cup of tea, change the television channel, could be anything, but it could also be to be called to be abused. So you didn't want to take the chance, you, d you couldn't risk it, so when you heard that sound, you didn't look around. And then eventually, if it was you, he wanted the click would come louder or he'd end up calling you and it, the minute you turn to face him he'd nod to indicate for you to go upstairs to be abused. You, you could be in the middle of playing a game, um, doing anything and you'd be called for this and it was just heart wrenching. Like your heart would just sink because it was so awful and you had no power, no control to do anything about it. You just had to go. And June, Paula and Joyce Kavner, very welcome to the morning show today. I have to say, in all my time doing this show, I don't think I've ever dealt with such a horrific story as the tale that the three of you have to tell uh, about your father, who June, not only abused the three of you, he also sexually abused your sister and physically abused your six brothers as well. Yeah, psychologically as well. There was no escaping. Like, if you weren't sexually abused, it didn't mean you got off the hook. He had such a dreadful, you, a dreadful presence. Like, you knew if he was in the house, everybody suffered at his hands. And control and bullying, he, he appeared to be afraid of nobody, so everybody got the rat. You just never knew what would set him off. He was a very aggressive man, wasn't he? Yeah. And sometimes, like, he'd never need to hit us. Like, there's ten in the family, and by the time we came along, I think he was exhausted. But, like, he wouldn't have to hit you. The threats would be enough because you know what he was capable of. When did the abuse start, Paula, for the three? I mean, I know it was at different times for the three of you. It, it, it was at different times for the three of us, but we were all very young. And even when we wrote the memories for the book, um, the, the, most of us started our memories older, the, the ones that we have in the book. But we all know that we were, we were so small that you'd have to be picked up and put on a, either the press or the bed. So that's how small we would have been. So for most of us, I think it would have been around four or five when he started. And he would have been grooming you way before then. And Joyce, it was a case that, from your memories, that it would have been happening every day. Absolutely. I have no, I have no recollection of any day it didn't happen. Um, yeah, I think it happened daily. I think it happened to every one of us. And this really throws people off because you can't imagine somebody having that kind of sex drive. But I actually don't think he had. I think it was about control. To have absolute control over somebody was what got him off. You know, we had to do all the work when it came to the sex. Like, you know, had to get him ready. Had to put it in the right place. And, you know, it, it, was, it was nothing, absolutely nothing to do with sex. And just the whole control thing as well. He, he tried to sort of involve you as well in the act the, uh, so that you were sort of taking on the, well, the responsibility. He, he, with that. every time that he abused you, the, part, the fact that you had to get him ready for start has made you responsible and made you take on the blame and the guilt of it. Also, because of the way the house was designed, you were the one who listened out for people coming up the stairs or somebody coming near you. So you were always on tender hooks waiting for somebody to catch you. Mm. Not for a minute thinking they would catch him. It was they would catch you doing something. And you, even though you knew it was really wrong, the fact that your father's doing it is what makes it very confusing. 
And you mentioned that, that the house there, Paula, the design of the house. June, do you think that that was part of his motivation as well, to have it sort of in little warrens and little alcoves and things like that? That Absolutely. you know, it would be hard. You yeah. know, there were little corners he could get away with this. Type Absolutely, because he built most of the house himself. Now he hadn't a clue. Like he put his hand to anything, but I mean, the house was falling apart. The electrics, the plumbing, the whole. He did the whole lot. And like he could open a press and come away with the door or the handle, <laughs> and, and presses built, went on a slant. He built a cup of tea down. It was horrendous. But yeah, he built it in such a fashion. Like people did get confused coming into our house. They didn't know how to get in and how to get out. There were little nooks and crannies everywhere. And I'd say yeah, it was deliberate. He also bred you to cough when you walked into a room. There was yeah. always little signals. Or wasn't make noise. There? Make, make noise. noise. Make yeah. a banging noise. Like you wouldn't sneak up the stairs. You'd make your steps heard. Yeah. And that was never said. You were never told to do that. Everybody in the house just, it was like an unwritten rule. Yeah. Everybody just did that. And the, the, the sexual abuse that was happening to you at various stages on a, a daily basis, did you know that, you know, each other was being abused at any We'd given We'd say time? absolutely no, we didn't. But in writing the book, we realised that when he clicked, the first thought was, I hope he doesn't want me. So somewhere, absolutely, you knew just not on a conscious level. It's like we knew to stomp up the stairs rather than sneak. We knew, but we didn't know. Uh, so it was never spoken amongst no. yourselves? No. no. There Do you was think unwritten rules in, in our whole upbringing, and the entire family were part of it, but it was never spoken about, and it would never have been on a full conscious level. And therefore, it's quite hard to describe to somebody or for somebody to understand, unless you've lived in it, you know what the norm is in your home and you just fall into place. It's also because I think um, how abusers actually work and how to get away with it is based on secrecy. But it's also about isolating somebody. It's about making them feel they're the only one. That's, it's something about that particular, about you. So in order for you to take on the responsibility, they have to get you to a mindset mm. where you are completely taking the ownership of it. And therefore, you're never likely to tell anybody because it's your shame, it's your guilt. Uh, so who would you tell? When it started Culture. from such a young age, I can imagine that it was just something that it was all you knew, that you just fitted into your, your daily lives. Yeah. And I think there's episodes where you, you might have been abused and then you go outside and play on the street. Yeah. Absolutely. It? Two minutes later, you're playing, red eyes. But then it was normal to be crying then. It could have been crying for anything. No one asked questions. And Culture actually supported that because the big thing in them days was you never spoke outside about what happened. What happened in the family stayed in the family and that didn't necessarily have to be about abuse. Like people, there was a lot of shame then, people were poor, there was very little they had, you know. So you didn't want to broadcast, it was rouse. I mean that was the days when men hit women, I'm not saying they don't now, but ne then it would have been no problem to walk around with your black eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you as a family were relatively well off in Valley Firm, is that right? Well, your we looked we well off. We appeared to be. You appeared. Mm -hmm. Your father was successful on the outside. He had shops, you know, he was very creative. Yeah. Um, he looked like a successful businessman. He also looked like a family man. He looked like he was into his community. He loved children. He was always doing something for the kids. Yeah. That was his thing. <coughs> he was always selling the fact that family is very important. You have to stick together. He, that's why he created the businesses so he could employ all of his family so we'd all be together I know <laughs> but that was the way he worked it was keep and that's, you close yeah mm. probably but also yeah. because he could then control everything you did so he controlled what you did in the morning how, what work you did what money you had where you went your freedom everything was tied up in in that being in that one house and while all this was going on, I presume he was also controlling your mother by keeping oh, her absolutely. in the shop at the front. Just uh, to talk to us a bit about that. Sure, we had a, a sweet shop at the time, and I suppose like uh, that's why people would have thought we were well off. But the sweet shop um, was at the side of the house. It was originally a garage, I think, and Dad converted it. But to leave the sweet shop to go into the house would have been an absolute disaster. So you had to ring a bell to be relieved to go in to even go to the toilet so there'd be no surprises and we'd never walk in you know mm. surprised you'd have to ring the bell somebody'd have to go out and relieve her to allow her to go to the toilet or otherwise whatever. everything in the shop would be robbed yeah. Hi, do you think your, your mother must have had an, an inkling though i mean if the whole 10 children four sexually abused all the boys been mentally and physically abused how would she not have in the same so way we knew, the same way I described to you, the unwritten rules. She was as much a victim of him as we were. And we've written about this, we've confronted, we've discussed 
And she was controlled by him. We, she met him at a very young age. She was churning out baby for years and she was tied up. I mean, there was no disposable nappies at the time. She was constantly working. And when she spoke to us about when we were children, if she showed any affection to any of the children at all, he'd end up bashing them. So she began to slowly shut down. And by the time we came along, she was nearly unavailable physically and emotionally to us. And it's taken us years to understand why. And to but herself, in yeah. fairness. Yeah. She wasn't she available just built to herself. all around her heart, basically. It all came to an end at, at different stages for yourself. But, but June, you actually said no one day. You just confronted it and said, when the click came, the signal, you said... Uh, I was very upset one day. Uh, Joyce had gone into town with a friend of hers and wouldn't bring me with her. And I even told her to be father and he wouldn't get he wouldn't come to my aid so i stormed up the stairs very upset crying lying on the bed and i'm sobbing and i was inconsolable and next of all i heard click click and i thought like he can't be serious i mean i'm devastated here and i heard it again and i thought i was just it was just I, I don't know where it came from, where I got the courage from, but I just said no. But as I said it and the realisation of what I said, I froze on the bed and waited because I thought I was going to be absolutely murdered. But nothing happened. And after a while, I looked over my shoulder, he was gone. I checked to see, was he waiting for me in his room? Because you had to pass through his room to get down the stairs and he wasn't there. So I ran out to play and I thought, you know, I'm never go. You know, I'm not going back in for a while. It's, I couldn't understand it, but then you're riddled with guilt as to if it was that easy, why didn't I do it before? I didn't know I had the power, and maybe I'm part. Maybe I'm part of the problem. You know, all of this, all these questions go through your head, and you begin to doubt the role you played in it, and it's just, it's an, it's another nightmare. He was eventually caught. Um he, the whistle was finally blown after he abused a grandniece. Yeah. Was that right? He ended up, he, he went to court and he got seven years. He got seven, 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 seven years to be run concurrently, concurrently because of his age. He got out after five years yeah, for, for good behaviour, behavior, yeah. which, you know, know, it staggers. Was, it, uh, really, was there any remorse even no. at yeah, sentencing, no. even when no. you confronted no. him? Did he show On any remorse? On the day of the sentence in the court, he got up and sacked his free legal aid team. And asked us where and we asked us where we yeah. finally happy. And no, I, mean, I don't think I, I think he's a sick man. I don't think he had any concept of the damage he'd done. And I think even at that stage, he was thinking more about what we were doing to him. Yeah. And you, you even say that in some ways now, at a distance, you feel pity for him. Oh, absolutely. He was sooner be us man. than him. Yeah. What a waste of a life. Yeah, it was a waste. And when you think of like, I mean, he lived to what seventy-five or something and five people turned up at his funeral. I think that's so sad, mm. so sad. Very finally, you've written a book, as we mentioned, Click Click, and what are your hopes for this book? We have many hopes for them. One is that we really feel this book could help frontline workers that work with children or adults who have been sexually abused. We feel that the child's perspective that's put in the book is really significant, and we believe there's so, we don't want we just feel we want to send a message out that if you have been abused, it doesn't have to define the rest of your life. And people might look at us and think, yeah, well, you're fine, you have your sisters, I have nobody. But in fact, it's a journey, really a personal journey you have to take on your own. There's nobody in your head. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we didn't have each other really until about the last year or two. Yeah. We've really bonded, and that's down to Marion's. Marion Quinn, who helped us write the book. And the, name, she, the, the book is called Click Click, and one of the subheadings is a shattered I Irish child, but it's great to see that you've put things back together again quite yeah. considerably. And people who will be watching this morning will say, God, look at them laughing. And, you know, but that is the way, <laughs> that's the way that you have coped to get Absolutely. over yeah. such a humor tragedy. We had, uh, probably some people probably say it was a six cents humour, but we did find funny things and everything. And okay. there's always a funny side to everything. Okay. And that did great. help us heal. Thanks so much for coming in and talking to us this morning. And I know the book has gone to number two on the bestseller list, so a big congratulations. Thank and thank thanks, thanks for coming on. Thanks very much.